Welcome back to the channel, everyone, and our next comic book recap and review. In 1988, the Joker brutally murdered Jason Todd, the second Robin, and for his crime, the end of that four-part series saw the Joker shot in the chest and caught in an exploding helicopter, which plunged into the waters off New York City. His body was never recovered. After that, a moratorium was placed on all new Joker stories at DC Comics. Then, Tim Burton's Batman hit theaters, reintroducing a new generation of fans to the Clown Prince of Crime in 1989. In the wake of that box office success, DC Comics decided it was time to bring back Batman's arch nemesis. So in early 1990, with Batman fever still running hot, DC ran a five-part series called A Lonely Place of Dying. This five-part story arc saw the Batman using reckless abandon still struggling with the guilt and loss of his crime-fighting partner. It was here we were introduced to Tim Drake, the boy who would become the third Robin. And we also got the main villain, Two-Face. Why is this story important? Because Two-Face was not acting alone. He was taking orders from a voice coming through a radio. Whose voice? No one knew until the final panel and a glimpse at a chalk white chin and ruby red lips. A few issues later in Batman number 450, we would get the return we all hoped to get. Our first panel of this issue shows us the first victim. A hardline judge known as the Hanging Judge was killed by hanging. A note left on his chest, he didn't get the joke. Commissioner Gordon observes the crime scene. His gut tells him what he does not want to know. The man he wished would never return, the man who crippled his daughter and forced him to watch, was back. The guilt, the pain, the feeling of helplessness flooded back as he drove home that night. Our next panel is that of a dilapidated brownstone. A shadowy figure struggles to walk as he listens to the news of the Joker's return and his most recent crime. His physical discomfort is accompanied by his criticism that the Joker's new joke is not funny. We then cut to a 747 preparing to land in Tokyo. It is carrying Tim Drake and his classmates on a field trip sponsored by Bruce Wayne. One of their chaperones calls Bruce from the airport. It is clear that the Batman does not want his new ward anywhere near Gotham City while there is a possibility that the Joker has returned. His doubt about taking on a new Robin begins to creep back into his mind, along with the thought that he may have to break his one rule and end the Joker once and for all if he really has returned this time. But despite the crime spree, life in Gotham goes on. A banquet hall filled with wealthy investors, flush with cash, are preparing to listen to Curtis Bass, a real estate investor who is fishing for capital to fund his next venture. Commissioner Gordon and his partner, Detective Hanrahan, are on site because Bass has received death threats from investors who have lost everything trusting him. As Curtis speaks to the crowd, he is interrupted by reporter Vicki Vale, who questions him about the recent financial losses. Bass dismisses her and begins to walk out of the room. At the same time, a group of criminals are outside, ready to unleash a pack of wild, rabid, shaggy dogs on the unsuspecting elite. As the dogs break into the banquet hall and attack, Detective Hanrahan runs to alert backup, but an arm clothed in purple reaches out to stop her. The commissioner is then startled by a voice commanding the group of criminals. He turns in its direction to see the one face he wished he would never see again. The Joker is sitting, conducting his symphony of chaos. He taunts Gordon and commands the dogs to maul another innocent bystander while he laughs hysterically. He then begins to tell a story, but is interrupted by the commissioner who recites his belief that the Joker is dead. The Joker then shoots another man in the head with a bullet shaped like an axe, quipping that he often cracks people up. The Joker then brings in Detective Hanrahan, who is gagged with a siphon, the Joker's men threatening to pour poison down her throat unless the commissioner quiets down. The commissioner, in shock, calls out to the detective by the wrong name, using his daughter's name, Barbara, to which the Joker seems puzzled. Having gathered all the cash available, the Joker and his men make their exit. The police backup shows up and they find a distraught Commissioner Gordon and Curtis Bass tied up in another room. They free Curtis who gives a statement and then is escorted by his personal aide Marty to his suite. Curtis asks Marty if he's with him no matter what. Marty reluctantly affirms this until Curtis opens the door to reveal that the Joker's gang is with him, that he staged the entire robbery, that he was behind the killings, and that the money he is making from it will fund his financial adventures, that this is the only way to do business by any means necessary. Marty is uncomfortable with this to say the least. Curtis, realizing that Marty is a loose end, throws him out of the window to his death. For Curtis, nothing can get in his way. As news of the Joker's robbery breaks on television, our shadowy figure in the rundown apartment is beside himself with the idea that the Joker is committing crimes with awful jokes that are just not funny. He maniacally rummages through debris to find an item that will help him understand what is going on. He finds it, a red helmet, a solid red hood. And we see a flashback to the time when the red hood led a gang into Ace Chemicals, only to have the Batman intervene, causing the red hood to fall into a vat of chemicals and wash up outside.
inside. Our mysterious figure places the red hood on, cape and all. He goes out, commits assault and robbery using a crowbar. The memory of that crowbar brings another flashback, that of Jason Todd, Robin, being beaten, and then the Joker being shot in the heart. Our mystery man is appalled and then drops a crowbar, realizing that this is how his problems all began. Unable to handle the trauma, he cowers in bed, shakes from the fear. The Red Hood rests beside him. That night, a train carrying money from the Gotham Federal Deposit is attacked. The Joker and his men kill the federal agents and take the money. All the while, the Joker makes bad joke after bad joke. At the scene of another Joker murder, the Batman and Commissioner Gordon begin to suspect something is not right. This new victim is covered and suffocated with chestnuts. Chestnut being an old-time slang term for a joke. It just does not seem like the Joker's style. They are beginning to think that the Joker they are dealing with is now someone different, like a skewed mirror reflection of the original. We then return to our mystery man, and the news broadcast tells of these new Joker crimes, and he gets upset, because these jokes are just not funny, and he's ruining the Joker's reputation. This is the last straw, and our mystery man finally reveals himself to be the actual Joker, and now he is motivated, angry, and as he states, this time, he's wild. Issue number 451 begins with our three main players. The Commissioner reminiscing about his daughter before the Joker paralyzed her. The Batman stewing as he looks at Jason Todd's old costume encased in glass, his failure ever on display. And in the middle, the Joker, going back to his first memories as a criminal to find what he has lost, to understand what has changed. The Commissioner is haunted by that night he was kidnapped and his daughter injured, the story now known as The Killing Joke. He tries to warn Barbara to keep her safe, but she won't run and she will not hide. The Joker is traumatized by his near-death experience. He takes a walk in the rain to get a newspaper and finds solace in the fact that his mere image can still conjure fear in the citizens of Gotham. And finally, the Batman remembers the explosion that ultimately took Jason's life and wonders if he will be able to restrain himself when he finally finds the clown prince of crime. Will he himself become a killer after all? Then we visit with our wild card in the story, Curtis Bass, the man impersonating the Joker to further his financial schemes. He preaches the benefits of wearing a Joker mask, how the city, the world is in fear of him, that he spent money and time researching everything about the Joker, that the Joker is eternal. Bobby, a member of his gang, questions Curtis about how far he's going with this new persona. Curtis lets Bobby know that his opinion does not matter and any disruption will not be tolerated as he threatens to drop Bobby out of a window this time too. This new action by Curtis upsets Bobby. He's determined to escape the city and hide. Meanwhile, the Batman is doing what the Batman does best, interrogating the underworld for information. He stops at a local dive bar where a patron is first helpful, letting him know where to find Bobby, and then tries to attack the Batman which doesn't work out well at all. And just as the Batman leaves through the front door, the Joker, the real Joker, appears through the back. He too wants info on this new Joker gang and gets the same tip. As a reward, he stuffs a cigar in the man's mouth. The man is frightened that it will explode and kill him, but it doesn't. And as the Joker remarks, never give them what they expect. And as Bobby returns to his apartment to pack and leave, he finds he already has a visitor, the Batman, who quickly gets the intelligence he needs and heads to the next crime scene before it can happen. Thinking he is safe, Bobby continues to pack when the Joker enters. Bobby thinks this is Curtis, but soon finds out that this is the real Joker and gives him the same info that he gave the Batman. The Joker leaves him strung upside down above the toilet before leaving. On his way, the Batman rendezvous with Gordon to share what he found. They both wonder how they will react if the real Joker shows his face, to which the Batman glides off without a final answer. But it may be too late, as Curtis, in full Joker garb, has already murdered again, using hundreds of needles and pins to slowly take a man's life. This time, he's at an airline office to counterfeit hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of phony airline tickets. He and his henchmen are not alone for long, though. The Joker barges in. The real Joker. But Curtis is ready. He fires a gun at the Joker, hitting him in the arm and causing him to go into mental shock at the thought of being hit with another bullet so soon. Curtis mocks the Joker and lets him know that he's gotten used to being him and that our original Joker is no longer worthy of that mantle anymore. The Batman and Gordon arrive on the scene. The Batman has the drop on both Jokers, but Gordon gets in the middle, like a deer in the headlights, wanting to shoot the Joker to end him, but indecisive. It gives Curtis just enough time to throw tear gas and make his escape, and the Joker enough time to hit Batman over the head with a chair and make his own exit. The Joker runs and cries in an alleyway at the shock of being shot, and the Batman and Gordon regroup. After the debacle, Curtis formulates a plan to rid himself of the Batman, Gordon, and the Joker once and for all. He sends a note to the police and the media. He wants to meet with Gordon and the Batman alone, where it all began. 
The Joker hears this on the news as he bandages his wound. The Batman knows all too well where it all began. Ace Chemicals. He and Gordon arrive only to be met with a hail of gunfire from Curtis. The Joker is also there trying to sneak up on Curtis to get the drop on him. The Batman is kept busy keeping Gordon safe from acid spilling everywhere as Curtis's bullets puncture holding tanks and chemical vats. The Joker, seeing Curtis occupied with the Batman, drops down from a skylight and begins to fight with this imposter. The Batman intervenes and Curtis declares that he will do what he has to do and become an even better Joker. He jumps into a vat of chemicals, believing it will turn his appearance to that of the man he seeks to replace. The Batman tries to warn him about the chemicals being stronger now than years before, but it is too late. Curtis is eaten alive by the acid. The Batman and Gordon take the Joker into custody, deciding not to kill him even though they want to, and deliver him to the one place the Joker can find solace and reconnect with who he actually is. A padded cell in Arkham Asylum. Our last panel is that of the Joker letting us all know that one day, he once again will be fully crazy and he'll be back. Thus ends the story of how the Joker returned from certain death after one of the most controversial storylines ever produced in the history of comics. I hope you enjoyed this look back at his return in the early 90s, and if you want more comic book fun, please click on the thumbnail for my playlist, Welcome to the Comic Verse. As always, I'm your reluctant gringo, and from south of the border, salut and a huevo.